we're not as crammed for time as the program said because the D Star Forum has been canceled after this. Okay, introduction to DMR. And this is the 2022 Hamvention. Missed the last two years. If you're interested in a digital for VHF, UHF, there's two other forums. Actually, there's only one anymore because the D-Star has been canceled at 1135. But the system fusion is in this room today at 355 if you're interested. I was trying to plug my competitors, but you know, they gotta show up to get plugged. I don't know what happened to Robin. Okay, me. I'm W2XAB, extra class, WQON 496 on GMRS. I have an undergraduate degree in cable communications, a master's in technology teaching, and a doctorate in industrial technology. Professional experience, about 25 years. Before I went into secondary ed, higher ed, taught for about 25 years in colleges and universities. I worked in the aerospace industry for Motorola and Cisco. And on the 2016 Hamvention Technical Achievement Award winner. The last one they had at the old Hair Arena. I really missed that place. It wasn't as nice as here, but I missed it. Okay, I have this little booklet on DMR. They're handing out cards. You don't have to write down the URL. You can download it for free. And eventually, I'll probably have a new edition as soon as I get around to it. Oh, great, it came on again. I've also uh, published in the QST and the AWRL handbook on DMR. Let's go back in history a little bit. I'm a history bluff. I like, you know, where things came from. Well, we started out in CW. Some years ago when I was here at the Hamvention, at a booth, we were promoting DMR. This older gentleman and what I thought was his son, I found out later was his grandson, came up to the booth. And the grandson was interested in DMR. And I, you know, talked to him a while. And then I said to the older gentleman, you know, are you into DMR? He says, I would never operate digital. I only operate CW. And when I told him CW was digital, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> then we, as hams, RTTY became popular, especially after World War II and all the equipment surplus was available. And then we moved into packet radio, AX.25, so our computers could send tech you know, back and forth before the internet. Digital voice. Giving credit where it's due, Alinko had the first VHF, UHF digital voice radios. It was actually an add-on board you had to buy to add into it. It never really caught on because there were no repeaters. Then we came up with D-Star. From the Japanese Amateur Radio League, and basically implemented by ICOM. And I've had both D-Star systems, System Fusion, and DMR, and Analog. Then we have DMR. Now, D-Star and System Fusion from Yezu are protocols specifically for amateur radio because they carry your call sign. DMR is a professional system. It's not designed for amateur radio. We, it does not transmit your call sign. It transmits a user ID. 
So you have to still ID with voice. Along with uh, DMR, there's some other professional protocols, NXDN from Kenwood, and then P25, which is the public safety standard in this country. And if you go to Europe, you also find Tetra. And Yezu's System Fusion is the last one to come online. Now, I'm pushing DMR, okay? But they're all basically the same. Basically, amateurs use digital repeaters as intercoms to talk to their local friends, people they see all the time. Now, with the hotspots, you start talking around the world, people you don't know, just like ham radio. But, I'm, you know, some people will say that's not ham radio because you're doing it over the Internet. To me, anything that increases enthusiasm in the hobby is good for the hobby. The digital repeaters, all of them, F Fusion, D-Star, DMR, can also serve as gateways to connect your communications across the network. So you can talk further than just the local repeater. They also all use vocoders. The vocoders take your analog voice and they convert it into a compressed digital data stream to cut down on the bandwidth. Now, Once we connect through the internet, whether you're with a repeater on one of the digital modes or you're using a hotspot, you're basically connecting to a conference bridge, an audio conference bridge, which allows multiple users to connect to the same conference bridge and share their audio. And then the conference bridge may be connected to other conference bridges. Big cascade effect. Users can then subscribe to a specific conference bridge. Now, sometimes I get asked, what protocol is best? You know, should I go out and should I buy DMR, DSTAR, or system fusion, okay? It's not an easy question. The way I like to answer it is it depends on what's being used in your area. If you belong to a club and they have a D-Star repeater and you're getting into this new digital mode, buy D-Star. If they have a system fusion repeater, buy fusion from Yezu. If they have DMR, buy DMR. And if you're lucky and they have multiple ones in your area, buy one of each. I just wish some manufacturer would come out with a radio that did all three. I mean, all these radios also do analog. You know, I teach beginning technician classes online, and, you know, I'm always asked, what should I buy for the first radio? And I said, well, it depends on where you live. If you go out and buy an analog-only handheld, it only works analog. If they have one of these D-Star, Fusion, or DMR in your area, you know, consider buying one of those because they also work analog. Now, this is an interesting new radio. I have not seen it here today. I found it online a couple of weeks ago. For Radio Odyssey, I, by the way, I make no commission on this because I'm going to push them other radios too. But it's an HF with DMR. It does, although it's optional. You know, if they can put DMR in it, they can put Fusion into D-Star. Now let's push them to do that.
Okay, what is DMR? It was developed by the European Telecommunications Standard Institute, ETSI, and it's used worldwide for professional radio. And by the way, there are a lot of public service agencies using it also. Although I can tell you, having worked for Motorola, Motorola wants to push P25, you know, but a lot of the smaller agencies can't afford it. And a worldwide, you know, they use DMR. Now, DMR is divided into what we call three tiers. One, two, and three. Tier one is a frequency domain, multiple access, six and a quarter kilohertz bandwidth. And it supports peer-to-peer, -peer, meaning radio-to-radio. -radio. It supports repeaters and link repeaters. The hams are not using it. I don't know of a single system in the United States that uses it. Tier two is where the hams have migrated to. It's a two-slot TDMA, time domain multiple access. It means the repeaters have effectively two repeaters in one. We call them time slots. So somebody could be talking on time slot one while somebody else is talking on time slot two. And it has what the FCC likes to refer to as a spatial efficiency of six and a quarter kilohertz. Now, the difference between spatial efficiency and the bandwidth, the bandwidth on DMR tier two is 12 and a half. But since there's two time slots, two carrier, effectively two signals, the FCC says it's effectively the same as six and a quarter. And each of the channels can be data or voice or both, a combination. Most amateur implementations use voice on both of them, and some use data on one of them. And it's what's used by 100% of the amateur DMR networks. Now, the advantage of it from a repeater operator standpoint, you have one repeater, one feed line, one duplexer, one antenna, and you got two repeaters. Now, it'd be nice if we had intelligent conversations going on both time slots at the same time. But it, what it does is a lot of systems will have local on one time slot and wider area on the other time slot or however they want to manage it. Then there's tier three, which basically builds upon tier two and allows for trunking, single site trunking, and some of the manufacturers have implemented multi-site <coughs> trunking. Hams are not using this for one reason, money. As I like to say, money cures all evils. It also stops people from doing things because they can't afford it. There are DMR systems around that have multiple repeaters on the same site. They may have a VHF and a UHF, and some of them will actually, in the metro areas, will have a DMR repeater that's networked, and then they'll have another DMR repeater that's not networked. So they keep the local traffic on the one that's not networked because of capacity issues. And like most repeaters, if you notice today, your peak time is commute time, going to and from work, especially in the metro areas. Everybody wants to know where the traffic jams are. We needed that coming up to the ham fest today. DMR is not better than Fusion, it's not better than D-Star, okay? It's different. 
you do get the two time slots. Probably the biggest selling feature for DMR is the cost of the radios. You can buy a dual band handheld for under $100, brand new. For most hands, that's well within the budget. Now, you can also spend $2,000 on a handheld. But the lower price has gotten more people into DMR. And there's so many manufacturers, because it is a worldwide standard. And a lot of them come out of China. DMR, D-Star, Fusion, all basically use the same vocoders from DSVI. Now, that's not in the DMR standard. It's not specified. It was used because Motorola decided to use it. And it's implemented either in hardware, firmware chip, or software. D-Star and Fusion use the same family of vocoders. You now I'm going to ask, why did they pick that? It's the most efficient and has the best compression until somebody develops something else. And there are groups of hands out there who don't think we should be using commercial vocoders. The problem is the people who think that don't have the money to build a radio that uses their own vocoder. And to get a manufacturer to do it may be a little more difficult. You know. But then again, we go out and we buy HF rigs, okay? How many people here build their HF rig? Raise your hand. Not a hand goes up, okay? We buy what's commercially available. If you remember, some of you may be old enough to remember back in the early part of the 20th century, in order to get a ham license, you actually had to go into the FCC and build a transmitter. You don't do that anymore. As of earlier this week, there were 8,949 registered repeaters on the DMR network worldwide, averaging about 1.6 new repeaters a day. There are 219,000 and change of user IDs, people that are registered radios. Now, some people have multiple IDs, so that's not a true number of the number of amps. And we're averaging about 60 new ones a day. That'll make the dealers inside real happy. Probably this weekend we'll get more than 60 a day. And in the U.S., there are 99,000 registered IDs. Some of you are sitting here that are registered. Now, the DMR networks are divided by infrastructure and politics. I say politics because politics does play a little part of it. The original DMR networks we're using what we call the C bridge, and they were all Motorola repeaters. Now, why were they all Motorola repeaters? Because some guys that worked at Motorola took some lab repeaters they weren't using anymore and distributed them to some hands. And when I got into it in DMR, that was basically your only choice. There was no MMDVM, there was no hotspots. Now, the C-Bridge is just basically a software server that acts as a gateway for repeaters to connect to and a conference bridge server. It's also sold by Bridgecom, and they call it uh, ARNS DMR. 
and it's the same product as the Seabridge, and the product is actually made by a company called Rayfield. Not Rayfield, Raynet, Ravendale, <coughs> out of New York. And then we have Brandmeister. Brandmeister is one of the other infrastructure servers. And the other big one is DMR Plus. Now, there's a lot of little ones, TGIF and others. You know, anybody can do it. If they want to, you know, get a software developer, write the software, it works. And these can interconnect, so you can, you can be connected to a Seabridge, which is connected to Brandmeister and also to DMR Plus for interconnect. Now, if you have a hotspot, you can't connect to the C bridges because they don't support hotspots, but Brandmeister and DMR Plus does, and TGIF and others do. The biggest thing I hear from users is about problems, troubleshooting. Why are not things as good as they hoped they were? Well, you need to understand we have what is referred to as the National Information Infrastructure, sometimes referred to as the Internet. Actually, the Internet doesn't exist anymore. It died a long time ago. Now what we have are a group of internets, lowercase i. The big internet has the uppercase i. What we have now is a number of internet service providers that run wide area networks, and they're interconnected. One of the problems on the internet, which has nothing to do with ham radio, is it's overloaded. Too much traffic. Too many people watching TV. Porn, YouTube, music, email really doesn't bother it. Well, one of the problems, and I've taught networking for over 25 years, is the fact what we call the internet, traffic is basically divided into two groups. TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP, User Datagram Protocol. TCP is a guaranteed delivery. When you're communicating over the internet using TCP, your computer gets an acknowledgement that the traffic got to the other end and it was good. UDP, User Datagram Protocol, is used for more for streaming. You send it and you hope it gets there. It's like first class mail from the post office. And that's getting worse every year. Well, what happens when the roads on the internet get jammed up, cluttered, overloaded? They have to dump traffic. They throw it away. And what they throw away is UDP traffic. Because UDP traffic, if it's thrown away, it's gone. If they dump TCP traffic, then what happens, the sender will resend it, which just increases the load. Now, the problem is with UDP, your streaming medias all use UDP, including D-Star, Fusion, DMR, as we communicate between these bridges, and we're communicating from your radio to, you know, once it gets to the repeater and it goes out on the internet, or from your hotspot, you know, you're using the UDP, and there's a chance it's going to be deleted or dropped. We also have a problem with hysteresis, which is time delay. 
every time your traffic, every time that little chunk of traffic you send hits an infrastructure device, it stops, it's processed, and it's forwarded. And the more stops you go through, the slower it gets. Now, to try to explain it to you in a graphical form, here we have a handheld accessing a repeater. It's going over RF, ham radio. Now, just like any radio communication, the user could be too far from the repeater, there could be noise interfering, many things can happen. Once it gets to the repeater, if it's going out further as a gateway, it's connecting to a router. The router then will connect it to the network, to your ISP. There it gets on the internet. This is where a lot of the problems happen. Now, I just show like one hop, but there could be one, 10, 15, 30 hops in that internet connection, going through different routers at different ISPs to get where it's going. It ends up at another router, at another location. <coughs> that router then is connected to a bridge, whether it's Brandmeister, DMR Plus, Seabridge, doesn't matter. They're servers. Traffic comes in, it gets processed. Maybe it gets connected to a conference bridge. Maybe it sends it out to somebody else. Then it goes back through a router again, goes out on the internet, travels through possible multiple infrastructure devices. Each one delays it a little bit, and each one may drop it for overload. It gets to another bridge. It's processed again. Then they send it out to another router. Send it out to the internet again. In this case, we're going to a repeater, which could just as well be a hotspot. It gets to the repeater. And then the repeater sends it to the handheld at the other end. Now, the problems you get into are the RF links from the radios to the repeaters. You also get into problems over the internet. They can all cause the traffic to get dropped. Now, if we drop a UDP data frame, chances are nobody's going to notice it. If we drop two or three in a row, we start noticing it. I had a gentleman one day call me, wanted to know. His hotspot was working fine, except late in the evening. And he couldn't figure out why late in the evening was a problem. And I said, do you have a teenage son? He says, yes. I said, I said, I'll bet you a dollar he's upstairs watching porn. He's eating up all your bandwidth. You know. I just moved out of New Mexico back to Tennessee. What I liked about New, Net New Mexico is I had one gigabit service, fiber optic to the home. Never ran out of bandwidth. Now I'm back down to 400 kilobits. Now, the other problem I've had with hotspots, and I'm not blaming hotspots, okay? I'm blaming users. And this may have happened to you. I don't know why they call me. I don't work with hotspots, but you know, they'll tell you what's wrong with it. 
the ham has the hot spot sitting on their ham in their desk. And they got their handheld radio. And they hear the traffic fine, but when they're talking, it's reported they're broken up. And they want to know how to cure the problem. I said it's real easy. Get off of get up off your butt and walk into the other room. And talk under your hot spot from the other room, it'll be fine. And they say, why is that? I said, because your hot spot's probably in a plastic box and the RF from your handheld is overloading the circuits. You are, you're in what's called the near field of your handheld transmitter. So if you get further away, it doesn't screw up the microprocessor. Of course, you could put your hotspot in a good RF type box. You know, but you know, the guy says, oh, I didn't know that. I said, or move your hotspot in the other room. Just get away from it a little bit. You know, I hate to say it. You get what you pay for. You know, you got a Raspberry Pi with a low board in it. And they're susceptible to RF, just like everything is. Now, if you don't, if your repeater is not networked, and you have two users on the same repeater, you know, the traffic goes into the repeater and back out, just like a normal analog repeater. As long as both radios are in range, they should be able to communicate. You don't have a lot of problems other than on the RF side. Some of the DMR technology, we talk about talk groups. And there's a zones and color code, code plugs, scanning, roaming, simplex, a MIC criteria, voting. I'm not going to cover the rest of them today. But you can take that card, you can download my book and read it. Talk groups. These are just audio conference bridges. It should be noted that on a repeater or on a hotspot, only one talk group can come out through the transmitter at a time. Unless you have DMR with two slots, so you can have one talk group on each time slot. The vendors can't agree on names. D-Star calls these conference bridges reflectors. System Fusion calls them rooms. DMR calls them talk groups. They're all the same thing. You know, a rose by any other name is but a rose. Simplex operation. Today, there's probably going to be a lot of simplex operation <coughs> on Fusion, D-Star, and DMR because we're at this big ham fest. Some years ago for DMR, I don't want to say the powers to be, but a gentleman's agreement was we were going to pick frequencies to use for simplex so as not to interfere with the analog users. Problem, you don't want analog users in DMR or analog users in D-Star or Fusion trying to use the same frequency at the same time. Does it get, doesn't work. So we have some standard frequency to use. In North America, 446.0275 is the common one over here. There are some others. If you go to the non-North America countries, they're on 433.45. And there's some for VHF. Now, the reason there's more UHF than VHF, I've been asked that, is in the beginning, almost all the DMR repeaters were UHF. Why? There were no VHF frequencies available in most areas for coordination. 
but there were plenty of UHF. And there were a lot of UHF motor roller repeaters available to buy. Now we're seeing some analog VHF show up. Sometimes they're, they're deciding to convert from analog to DMR, or analog to fusion, or analog to D-Star. Their old analog repeaters are wearing out, and they decide for clubs, ah, oh, we need to upgrade. One of the different things about DMR, not greatly different, you need to know what frequency. You need to know what color code. Color codes are not optional. They're like CT, CSS, or PL. You have to use a color code. Color codes are 0 through 16. One is the default. If you don't have the correct color code, you will not access a repeater. One of the nice things about DMR, technically, as opposed to Fusion and D-Star, it's bidirectional. When you go to transmit into a repeater, the repeater has to acknowledge you. Otherwise, your radio will stop transmitting. So there's a two-way handshake. Now, what can you buy for DMR? I'm not going to show you some of the cheap radios. I'm going to show you some of the expensive radios. The ones you can't afford, possibly. Some of them, at least. And this is not a complete list. When we get into the Chinese-made radios, the list would be pages long to make them. And some of the companies don't actually make them. They just import them and put their name on them. This is probably the top-of-the-line DMR radio for Motorola. It's an ion. UHF, it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. It's Part 90 certified, which means for commercial. It also has 4G and LTE in it. Of course, to use 4G and LTE, you've got to subscribe to one of the carriers. And it's Android-based. And the manufacturer suggests his list price is about $3,500. Expensive. The batteries are about $180, $190 in one spare, spare battery. Although the hand-friendly price is down a little bit cheaper, it's about $1,800. Then the R Finder B1 Plus. It's dual band VHF, UHF, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, 4G, LTE. It also does voice over IP, and it's linked to the repeater database, and it's going for about $1,100. I don't know if they're selling any inside or not. They, hopefully they are. Now, it does analog and DMR. I don't have this model. I actually have the previous model. I don't have the plus. What I like about it, you know, there's things you like about all radios. I like when I'm traveling. It has a database and it tells me what repeaters are close to me. I don't have to look up in a book. I think that's a great advantage. Although, if you're a homebody and you always operate from home, it's not going to do you much advantage. But it's nice they link it to the database. And by the way, the database is never correct. 
because the repeater operators don't keep it updated. But it's better than nothing. It's more up to date. There's nobody here from the league. I can, if you go out to the AWRO and you buy their repeater directory, it only comes out once a year. So at some point, it's 12 months out of date. At least with this database, it's you know maybe only a week out of date. Then this is Motorola's top of the line, or next to top of the line, the ion it is. It's their new R7. A little bit cheaper, it goes for about 2100 manufacturers suggested. And you can get them for about 1000 to 1200 on a ham-friendly dealer. And then this is one of the more popular ham rigs, the Anytone. How many people here have an any tone? Raise your hand. Okay. You know, it goes for about 300 although I noticed the other day it looked like they raised the price to about 314 some of the dealers. Probably having to do something with imports. And then Alinko has one. Their DJ MD5. Dual band. It's part 90 also, which means it can be used commercially. And it's a little bit cheaper, it's about $190. And there's a lot of lower price ones. You can find them on Amazon, on eBay. They've got, they have websites. Some of them they direct ship from China. Although, I don't want to be negative about anything, but I had a friend who bought one of the cheaper handhelds from China. I think he paid $79 for it. He got it and it didn't work. Called the, you know, who he bought it from, or emailed them actually. And they said, no problem, we'll replace it. Just send us back the radio. He found out it cost more to ship the radio back to China than to buy a new one. As I told him, I consider those handhelds that are under $100 as throwaway devices. When they break, take the battery off, the antenna off, and throw it away. Buy another one. And then if a handheld is, doesn't make you happy on DMR, Get a mobile. Need a little more power? Motorola makes them a good, a good one. Kenwood, not on their amateur division, but on their commercial division, makes the NX5000 series. I, if I had the money, I'd buy an NX5000 because besides DMR, you can get NXD, N, and P25 in it although there's very few NXDN and P25 amateur systems around. And then Alinko makes one, Anytone makes one, Radio Diddy, or however you pronounce it, they make a couple of them. If you need a little more power, you know, if you live in the, met if you live in the metro area, in metro areas, normally a handheld works fine. You live more in the rural area, you may need a little more power. You may need an antenna on the roof of your vehicle. And then if you want direct access to some of the networks, you can get a hotspot. How many people were thinking of getting a hotspot? Just think, okay. Got a couple. I think a lot of you already have hotspots. You can always buy another one. One warning about hotspots. Keep them off the satellite frequencies, please. Bridgecom sells their SkyBridge Plus hotspot. Not necessarily a cheap one. Works fine. I didn't buy the Plus, I bought the earlier one. And the one thing I liked about it, I took it out of the box and it was operating in less than 10 minutes. 
By the way, not to plug Bridgecom too much, but I think they have the best customer support. And if you're a new ham or you're getting into something you don't totally understand or you have a problem, you do need support. And then there's here's a Zoom. And you can build your own. Get a Raspberry Pi, get a plug-in board for it. Be a little more, you know, in duty, industrialist. Although I will tell you that some of the boards they get out of China are clones and they have problems. So I always say buyer beware. You get what you pay for sometimes. Now, DMR started out as a one network in the beginning for the hands. We had one network. It's evolved to where we now have multiple networks. I operate a DMR network called K4USD. We have about 50 repeaters in 17 states. From a political standpoint on my network, my policy has been I don't get involved with politics. I let the individual repeater operators do whatever they want. They set their own rules. Where if you get on some other networks, I like to use the term the draconian. Some networks have very draconian rules and they tell people this is the way you have to operate. To each their own. And if, if you're not happy with the network, you can buy your own network. It only costs money. You know, if you think you can do it better than somebody else, do it. That's ham radio. I can run a little bit over because the D-Star Forum got canceled. We got growing pains. As more and more people get on, you know, there's more issues. If you want to listen to a lot of the foreign stations, remember the other side of the world is 12 hours removed from us. Okay? I've actually had people contact me about how come the worldwide net on Brand Talk Group on Brandmeister is not that busy during the day but it's busy at night. Well, I said, you know, the plant rotates, okay? And on the other side, you know, when it's nighttime here, it's more daytime there. We also need to support public safety. That's one of the purposes of amateur radio. We got RACES, ARES, the American Red Cross, Salvation Army, and there's a whole group of other ones. Some of the advantages of the digital, it's more secure because it requires a specialized receiver to receive it. Digital has a little bit better range than analog. Now, it's not so much that it has a greater range. It has a greater range where you can understand it. You get an analog repeater and you're out at the fringe, you can be almost all noise and no one can understand you. Digital stays pretty good until right when it gets to the end and then it falls off. DMR also supports encryption. Now, this is political, okay? I don't know how many hands have told me encryption is illegal on amateur radio. And I said, I'll give you $100 if you can find anywhere in Part 97 of the rules that says you can't use encryption. Okay? It's not there. What is there is messages encoded for the purpose of obscuring their meaning. I can tell you, having taught cybersecurity, 
There's a difference. It's, here they say the intention has to be to obscure the meaning, not to keep someone from copying it. If your intention to encrypt is to keep people from copying it, that doesn't meet the definition of the rule. By the way, in some countries, encryption is specifically allowed as long as they publish the encryption key. Now, I'm not suggesting everybody run out and do encryption. But when you're supporting some of these you know, government organizations, this may be an issue. Now, the League may not agree with me, but that's all right. I don't agree with everything the League does. Okay? But I just go by the rule. I have nobody's ever collected the hundred dollars from me yet. We need to prepare for emergencies. I mean that's that's one of the big purposes of amateur radio. Because the internet will fail. I'm gonna tell you that. It fails. Landline phones will fail. Cellular telephones will fail. Public safety systems will fail or get overloaded. Commercial power will fail. Water and sewer will fail. Now, I can handle water failing, but the sewer backing up with kind of make it a little bit worse. And the government is good for writing reports six to 18 months after the event. They're really good at writing reports. But don't expect them to show up and help you. We need to be prepared. We have a backup communication system, whether it's analog, it's HF, it's D-Star, it's DMR, it's Fusion, doesn't matter. We have the ability to back up communications. You know, we need to harden repeaters. We need emergency power. We need to interconnect repeaters over our own network and get off the damn internet. You need go kits if you're going to get deployed. I actually have two go kits with DMR repeaters in it. And you also have to remember about your family. Most of you want to keep your family safe. Some of you may not, but most of you do. Okay? You need to plan for that. And as I tell ARES groups and stuff, if you have a disaster in your community, it's not you that's going to help. It's your neighbors that are going to come in and help you. So that's called mutual aid. Because if you have a disaster in your own community, you better be more concerned about your own family. Your spouse and kids will not be happy if when your house blows down or burns up, you decide to take off and go help somebody else. And all of this requires training. If you want to build a ham-based TCP IP network, there's a group out there called Arden that has built some networks in different parts of the country. If you want to connect a few repeaters in an area and stay off the internet, this is a good choice to go with. And I'm done. Questions? You first and then you second. Okay. You're going to have to speak up. Difference between a duplex hotspot and a simplex. A duplex hotspot has two time slots. It has two time slots. But you don't need two antennas with DMR.
Yes. So then you can have two radios. One on one time slot and one on the other. Now you have to be able to listen to two at a time. Yeah. I would say most hotspots are simplex. I can't listen to two radios talking at the same time. They go in two different ears in the brain and they get mixed up. Actually, a lot of things get mixed up in the brain, anyways. And there was a gentleman back there. Can you come up or with this? I, uh, you're not going to use DMR and HF. Uh, there are a lot of digital modes for HF. And I'm really not into that, okay? So I'm not the right person to ask. There's PACTOR, AMTOR, uh, F FT8. You know, they're all different proto. Oh, the audio? Fusion is reported to have a better quality audio than DMR and D-Star, because they have the option of using more bandwidth. The problem is communication quality is fine. Anyone else with a question? I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. There's this fan up here. I'm a new fan. Okay. I'm in the DMR. I can get a repeater from my house. I don't have a hotspot. Can you speak a little bit about should I get a hotspot? The advantage is this advantage. Well, if you can't hit a local repeater. I can. You can? I can from my house. But what, the hot spot, what the hotspot gives you is the ability to use any of the thousands of talk rooms that may not be available on the repeater. You have to remember, repeaters are shared resources. You can, act, if, you, if you're using a repeater, you're keeping somebody else from using it, okay? Just like an analog repeater. So that's, you know, if you, if you want to spend an hour rat chewing with somebody in Europe, get a hotspot. I mean, that would be my recommendation. Uh, if you want to rat chew with some locals, Use the repeater. I mean, there's not a right or wrong answer. It's, it's individual. I mean, I, I have a hotspot. I never talk on it. I only use it for testing. Although I do have two repeaters at home. Real repeaters, okay? And I use those for monitoring networks. And I also have put repeaters in my vehicle. So when I go someplace, I don't have to worry about it. You know. Of course, my wife complains about that. You know. But I wouldn't trade my wife, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Terra, uh, Kenwood, and there's a couple of foreign ones that make. Now the problem, if you're going out to buy a repeater, what are you going to connect it to? And not all the networks support all the protocols that different vendors use. The Seabridge, for example, only supports Motorola repeaters. Uh, Grandmeister supports Hyterra. I believe they support Kenwood also. And there's a couple of Chinese companies that make them. So you have to think about what are you going to connect to? I mean, for a local repeater that's not connected, they all do the same thing. Okay? 
but when you're connecting to the network, you have to find a bridge to support you. And you can buy them used on eBay. There's a lot of used stuff on eBay. Uh, a Motorola repeater is going for about a grand used. And the reason they're going for a grand used is companies are upgrading. They're buying the newer units that have more possible more features, but hands don't use them. Or like my friend, uh, he's not here anymore. Uh, yeah, he is. He bought three of them at an auction. Question. Yeah, if you send me an email. I don't have that. Yeah, you'll find this stuff in the book. Yeah, if you download the book.